hand over to Martin Neukom and a presentation about characterization of the next generation of solar cells. Okay, thank you, Moritz. Yeah, good, good afternoon. I'm happy that still some people are here. I mean, it's Barcelona, nice weather, and one could also go outside. So thank you for joining. Um, I will be presenting here uh, a, a review paper that we made on, on characterization techniques. It has just been published and uh, it will appear online, I think, within two weeks. So when we talk about optoelectrical characterization, it's, it's very difficult in, in, in perovskite especially, or, but also in organic solar cells, to really extract accurately parameters. There are several techniques where people extract mobilities or electrical permittivity or whatever, but it's difficult because all the parameters are somewhat, somewhat entangled. So what we try to show here is a bit an overview on all the techniques that are available and what effects can you see in all of these techniques. So to do this study, we first defined, so it's a, it's a simulation study, we first defined like 10 cases of common defects. So there is one base case we call, this is just a regular, you can imagine as an organic solar cell, it's 100 nanometers thick, it could also be a quantum dot solar cell, whatever. And then we add cases where something went wrong. For example, in this case, extraction barrier, we have added an extraction barrier that could be some aluminum oxide, for example, formed on the, on the interface that creates such an extraction barrier. Here we have a low non-aligned contact that would mean you have a very low uh, uh, built-in voltage. Then we have a case with low mobility, high recombination, and some cases where we have traps. So deep traps lead to shockley reed hole recombination, or here just shallow traps, and one case with doping, and here are some further cases. And when first we simulate an, an IV curve, to, and, and it's always in the same, in the same view here. So we have uh, here the extraction barrier. So in the extraction barrier case, you see the IV curve has, shows such an S shape. That's what we expect for extraction barriers. You see here the normal case, this is the black, like the black one is always the reference, that, that is the, the reference uh, solar cell. When we have the non-aligned contact here, it is, the cell is just shifted to the left. That's also what we expect. When you then look at the other curves here, it's a bit more, it's a bit more difficult to understand. Um, the mobility influence field factor and the current as well as the, as well as the recombination um, and also here the traps, but it's not so easy to distinguish all these. What might be interesting is that the case of high doping density also reduces the, um, the fill factor and the current significantly. So that's uh, important to know because a high doping density kind of screens the field and therefore the char charges cannot be extracted anymore. That's why doping is very detrimental in case of organic solar cells because the diffusion length of the carriers will be much too small. We need an electric field. All right. So let's now start with the first technique. It's uh, the easiest one, measuring just a dark IV. What is quite obvious when you look at these, at these graphs here is that one sees the, the parallel resistance, so the shunt resistance in, in the device, one, one um, recognizes this very well. And in our cases, it's the only case where you, get, where you have a higher reverse current. So from the dark IV, you can accurately extract your, your parallel resistance if there, if there is one. Another thing that's interesting from the dark IV curves, you can, you can extract an ideality factor, so-called dark ideality factor by fitting the single diode model to, this, to these equations here. And I've shown the dark ideality factor that I extract from these simulations. I've shown it here on the, on the bottom right. And what you see here, there's only one case that shows a high, high dark ideality factor in a, in, in a range of two. All the others show, it, show something in the range of one or 1.2. And the one here that shows the high value is the case with shockley reed hole recombination, so the case with the deep traps. So we can say it in, in our simulation study here, we can accurately determine the recombination type. So if there is a lot of shockley reed hole recombination, the dark ideality factor is somehow a, a way to, to define this, to, to notice this. Um, Another way to measure the dark ideality factor is so-called VOC versus light intensity measurements. It's also very typical. You then um, put the light intensity in log. So you have this linear VOC dependence on the light intensity. And what you see here is if you change, for example, the mobility or the recombination, basically what happens is you shift this curve up and down. And the only case where something else happens is, the, again, the case with the deep traps. So the, the slope, you see the slope is kind of constant, and with the deep traps, the slope changes and gets steeper. 
And from this slope, you can extract the light ideality factor, which I show again here. And also here you see it's 1.8, so it's not exactly two, of course, because it never really matches. Um, but also in this case, we see this is a strong indication that um, if you see such a high ideality factor, it's, we have some shockley withhold recombination. But however, one needs to be careful because when you look here at the case with uh, shunt resistance, then the curve looks completely different. And if you would extract from this curve here an ideality factor, you would be way off. You would, you would, maybe you would here have an ideality factor of 10. So it would be completely wrong. So that's just to be, one needs to be a bit careful. Okay, so let's now talk about photo sea lift. I don't know how familiar you are with, with the photo sea lift technique. So the idea basically is that you create some charge carriers inside your device. You've, you keep the device at, at VOC so the charge carriers cannot, cannot escape. And then you run a negative ramp, a voltage ramp to the negative. So like, like this here, for example. And what you then get is a constant displacement current. This is because your device has a certain capacitance. And if there are charge carriers inside the device, you get here an additional overshoot. And what can we learn from analyzing this current? What people usually do is they say, they analyze here the peak time, and then use a simple formula like this here to calculate the charge carry mobility. What you can also do is you can integrate the charge here and find a measure of the charge in the device. So for example, you can extract the doping density in case of dark sea leaf, and you can also extract the relative permittivity. So we simulated now our cases that we have defined first in the dark. This is what you see here. And interestingly, you don't see anything. You see here, this is just displacement current and RC effects. So in the barrier, the contacts have no influence. The mobility, the recombination has no influence. The traps have no influence. But there's one case where something changes. It's this here. It's the case with uh, high doping density. Because in the dark, a normal intrinsic solar cell has no carriers. That's why. And so uh, you cannot extract any carriers. There is no overshoot. Unless your device is doped. So then you extract the free, uh, the free carriers that are inside the device because of the doping. And this is what you see here. So there is a P-doped sample, and you just extract the mobile holes that are inside. When you now integrate this curve here, so the difference between the RC effects and what you get, you can get an estimate of the, of the doping density. So we did that here for our simulation. What you see here, uh, you cannot really read it, but it's 10 to the 16. So we extract the doping density of 10 to the 16. Actually, we put in the doping density of 10 to the 17. So you see what we extract is always lower than uh, what the effective density is. And the reason is simple. With the sea leaf techniques, you will never be able to extract all the carriers that are inside. So one just needs to be careful. But when, when, when one sees such an overshoot in the dark, it's pretty, you can be pretty sure that your device is doped. All right, let, let's now look at what happens in photo -celic. So it's now the, again the same experiments, but we create charge carriers before by a light pulse. Therefore, in all cases, we see such a, a current overshoot. Because now in all cases, even the intrinsic cases, they have three mobile carriers that we can extract, electrons and holes. What we see is the case in extraction barrier and the non-aligned contacts, also they have not, not a huge influence. But what we clearly see is in this case here, where we have the low mobility, we see that the peak is much, much slower. And here you see the principle of Seeley. So we have this voltage ramp, and the charges come out. And if they have a low mobility, it takes just a longer time. So when you calculate the mobility from this peak time, you get a much lower mobility. Another thing to notice here is um, the peak height. The peak height um, is, you see it here, if you have a high recombination, then you have a small peak. That's pretty obvious, because when your charges recombine quickly, then there's less charge available that you can still ex extract. The same counts is also true for the deep traps. However, here in the case of the shallow traps, you see the, in the peak increases, and that's quite, quite easy to understand because when the charges are in a trap, they're kind of protected from recombination, and therefore in the end you extract more charges. So when we now use this mobility formula that I showed before to analyze the simulation data to see what mobility comes out, we see it in, in these curves here. Um, unfortunately, on the, 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 there should be small gray lines, but you cannot see them here. The small gray lines indicate the mobility that I put in into the simulation. What well, you cannot see here, but what in the end is, is the result is you can get more or less the, the, the mobility out that you put in, but it's, there's an error margin, of course, by a factor of two or three. 
but you see you only get the order of magnitude. It's not as precise because you can imagine this formula that is very general and, and only analytic formula. It's never as precise as a full drift diffusion simulation. Okay, so let's now look at the next experiment. This is open circuit voltage decay. It's basically very simple. You connect a very big resistor to your device, so it's, it's, you, it, you keep it at open circuit. You turn the light on and you turn the light off and you see how the, how the open circuit voltage kind of decays over time. And this is what you see here. So here you start that there's, this device has an open circuit voltage of almost one. And so here it, it, it decays and then here there's a more rapid decay at the end. What is most visible here is again the parallel resistance because the parallel resistance kind of depletes our, our solar cell and the charges from the solar cell move rapidly. That's why you see here on the, on the left, on the lower left, that here the, 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 um, the voltage decay is the fastest. We, um, normally people use these zero dimensional models to, to analyze uh, recombination. So you say I have just a charge carrier density and then I assume uh, I have some recombination constant and I calculate just with a rate model how the charges recombine. When we do this here, we get kind of this formula for the decay. So you see here with just one charge carrier density, so which is, um, which is um, number of electrons and holes. And when we plot this, you see it in the very fine gray line, you see this behavior here. And so what's obvious is that in our simulation, where we simulate it in, in one dimension, somehow the recombination is slower than in our zero-dimensional model. And that's quite interesting to understand because that's very important when we characterize organic solar cells. Our models where we assume we have just electrons and holes and they recombine, we assume that they are all in the same position. But that's only true when we have very high light intensities. That's why here at the beginning you see there's no deviation. But as soon as the charge carrier density gets lower, charges separate, so they're not at the same position anymore. And then the recombination is not governed by the recombination constant and the number of carriers. It's dominated by how fast can these two carriers move into the middle of the device to recombine there. That's just an interesting thing. From this um, experiment, you cannot directly extract a recombination constant, therefore. You see here, if you have some traps, the, the shape changes a bit. If you have Shockley read hole recombination here, the decline is a bit faster. But you need to quantitatively analyze, uh, qualitatively analyze this. Um, let's quickly look at deep level transient spectroscopy. That's a technique that's often used to characterize trap densities and tra trap depths. So we can even extract um, trap distributions. In our case, um, we just, you, what you simulate is you just simulate a voltage pulse. So we go from minus five, for example, to zero, or the other way around. And what you see here is you have first some RC effects and then pretty nothing here. And this is in all cases, it's, it looks like this, except the case with shallow traps. In case with shallow traps, you, you have a voltage ramp, and we have a voltage step, I mean, and the charge carriers are still trapped. And then you see how these carriers are being detrapped over time. And this is what you see here, this, this small green line here. And this detrapping current is exponential. So just notice this here is a log-log scale. That's why an exponential looks like this. Usually this simulation is then done on different temperatures. So it's what we show on the lower left and the lower right, I'm sorry. Um, here we show the simulation at different temperatures and you see then that this exponential decay here, it's dependent on the temperature. And from that, with a Arrhenius plot, you can easily extract um, the, the trap density. And when we do this, apply it to our simulations, we, we um, extract the, the trap depth quite accurately. By, well, no, I forgot one thing. Um, when you look at the case with the extraction barrier, the decay here looks very similar. So we need to be careful not to misinterpret such a barrier as a trap. Because when you imagine the, tr the carrier is waiting in front of the barrier until it has enough thermal energy to overcome the barrier, that's basically very, very simple than a trap. A charge carrier is being in the trap, waiting to have enough thermal energy to leave the trap. So here we need to be, to be careful not to misinterpret such um, a TL TLTS curve. Um, interestingly, is, interesting is to analyze the trap emission current. So imagine you have, uh, for a solar cell, you illuminate it, for example, or you apply a voltage, you fill the traps, 
And then you turn it off and you just measure the current. What you measure then is how charges move out of the traps and uh, move through the circle. Here we use one um, density of states that is exponential, so an exponential density of states into the band, um, and calculate how charge carriers move out of this. When we do this, we get um, a power law decay of the current. This is what you see here. So it's again the current density versus the time. So this is log log. Get a power law decay, very interesting. When you have um, like a, sh a trap that is in the middle of the band gap, just one position, um, then you get here an exponential decay. So from the form, from the shape of the decay, we can make conclude if our trap distribution is rather like, like this here, somewhere one trap, one particular energy level in, in the middle, or um, if it's uh, a density of states, trap density of states reaching into the band gap exponentially. All right, I think uh, I don't have so much time left, I guess. No? OK. So I will skip some of the further slides. Uh, please have a look at the, at the publication. If it comes out, the good thing about the publication is you only need to look at the figures, because then you can uh, already interpret your, your measurements. Then you can look at the figures, compare it with your measurements, and get an idea what could be wrong with your solar cell in case something is wrong. So this is capacitance voltage I skip. This is transient photocurrent, very interesting. This is charge extraction, also very interesting, and there's many more that I could not put in because I would take like one hour, I think. But at the end, I would like to show you a global fit because what I showed here is mainly if you want to use a, a qualitative analysis. If you want to get out the parameters precisely, you need to do simulation. There's no other way. What we did here is we took a PCB, TBT solar cell um, from uh, Karlstadt University and we used our global fitting, so all the simulation to fit the, the measurement. And what you see here is the black curve is the measurement, the red curve is the simulation, and it fits quite well in all the cases. So IV curves under illumination fit, dark IV curve fit, VOC versus light intensity fit. It only, this only fits if you add shock reed hole recombination. Dark sea lift and light sea lift fits, open circuit voltage decay fits, transient photocurrent, IMPS, capacitance frequency, capacitance voltage. So here we have really a complete picture. And therefore, in this case, we are sure that, well, confident, let's say, that we have extracted a decent, decent amount of parameters that are more or less accurate. These are the parameters in case you're interested in. So um, you see there's electron hole mobilities, trap parameters, and so on. And what's to say is that um, this model are rather simplified. I suggest to use simple models instead of complicated ones, because if, with the complicated ones, it's just easier to fit, and it's also easier to make a fit that is in the end wrong. All right, so that's, my, that's our team at Floxim. Um, and well, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. There are there? immediately some questions. Sorry, Eugene, ladies first. I think, I think he was first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, just really briefly, so one of the issues if you have low mobility materials, sorry, I tried to stand up without knocking all the tables over, um, is that you get an artificial shallow trap because you don't have a, uh, a homogeneous distribution of carriers in the device. So do you have a way of distinguishing whether you have space charge effects uh, that give you the appearance of a shallow trap versus space charge effects? Yeah, I think it, it, it depends, because if the trap is very shallow, let's say only 0.1, we simulate this just as a bit of lower mobility. But um, if the trap is deeper, so in our case, shallow means 0.3 <coughs> electron volt. So 0.3 electron volts there, we really see that the charge gets trapped, and then it takes a while until it's detrapped. But then if, it's, if it's only more shallow, then we, then we use uh, just a constant mobility that is a bit lower than before. But you assume constant distribution of charge and constant well, the charge carrier density, we don't put it in as, a, as, a, as an input. It's just an, a simulation output. So we've, we fix the charge carrier densities at the boundary. So we say electron and hole dan and densities are fixed. And then we simulate how the densities um, how the charge carriers distribu distribute. But um, the mobility is always the same. So, OK. Um, you have an experience working with uh, perovskite cell. In your view, what is more special if you have this extremely long response, uh, hysteresis, et cetera, et cetera. 
I think the techniques that I showed here, basically they also work for perovskite solar cells. The difficulty is just when you perform, for example, the sea lift, within the time scale of the sea lift, the ions won't move. That's quite, that's quite sure, but you don't know where the ions are, but they will still, even if they're just somewhere in the device, they will influence your, your sea lift curve. At least that's what I see. So when we do measurements like these on perovskite, we need to make sure that we first put the cell to a defined state. So for example, what I often do is I can keep this device for one minute or for 10 minutes at a certain voltage to say, okay, now first I precondition the ions and then I do the experiment. And so therefore I think with perovskite it works as well, but one needs to be very careful not to misinterpret because the mobile ions make everything a bit more complex. Okay. All right. I think we have to move on. Thank you very much again, Martin.